All right, folks, thank you for joining the third episode of Cybersecurity Decoded here with Rubric Zero Labs. I'm incredibly excited to jump into this session. Uh, before we do that, let's just do a quick recap. This is our third. We started with Wendy Whitmore, head of Palo Alto Unit 42, talked a lot about what we saw in the intrusion space and what we also saw in our rubric research. Second interview, we had Suzette Kent, where we focused on her work at the federal CIO level and really around workforce management and large scale initiatives. And I'm really excited to do this third one. We're gonna have on here with us, Sandra Joyce from Mandiant Intelligence. Just as a quick scene setter, uh, I worked for Sandra at my previous job. So her and I have had a number of these conversations point to point. I'm really excited to have those out loud. So with no further ado, let me introduce Sandra really quickly. For those who have never met Sandra, she's been running Mandiant Intelligence since 2017 where she oversees all threat research activities and operations of that organization. Recently moved into Google Cloud, where she is now the Vice President, Google Cloud Head of Mandiant Intelligence. She's also spent time in the US Air Force, where she's an active reserve officer and a faculty member with the National Intelligence University. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, she's also currently pursuing, pursuing her PhD at Johns Hopkins, while also a member of the Aspen Institute Cybersecurity Working Group, also on the Council for the Silverado Pol Policy Accelerator, and as well as already knocked out, was it four or five masters, Sandra? I forget. Probably too many. <laughs> too many, I love that, the best way to do it. Sandra, thanks for joining us. Really excited to have you Thank here. Thank you, Steve. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. All right, Sandra, so I want to jump right into a topic you and I have spent a ton of time on. One of the things as we looked at our first Rubik Zero Labs research report, one of the things that jumped out and won't be a surprise to you as, as I know it's a, a major topic for you, but it's the impact of all of this intrusion work on our people. There's really two data elements that, that jumped out to me in particular and we've talked about quite a bit. The first is that we see a high majority of individuals affected by these intrusions. 96% of IT and security decision makers reported an emotional or psychological impact based on having to work intrusions in the last year. The second one that really jumped out was about a third of those intrusion events led to a leadership change, which can be really traumatic on teams as well as people. So we're talking about culture, we're talking about burnout, we're talking about impacts working these really tough, difficult problems. And what I'm basically describing is your entire team and mission. So how do you handle this on your end? How do you handle culture and burnout with a high performing organization like yours? That's a really good question. And you know, what's at the core of it is that, you know, security people are mission people. And what I mean by that is they really are driven by what they're doing, by, you know, sometimes being the only thing standing between an APT group and the network that they're trying to protect. So they feel a really a real deep sense of responsibility and attachment to that mission. Well, when you pair that with uh, this this really overwhelming amount of, of incidents and breaches, because, as you know, it's not just a, an incident in your own organization you have to manage. If there is something very impactful that happens, like a log4j or something that's external, you still have to go in and manage it within your organization, find out how vulnerable you are, and it starts this sort of cycle of activity. And at Mandiant, uh, one of the biggest examples of this was when we were spinning up to support the efforts in Ukraine with the Russian invasion. So at that point, which I think you'll remember, Steve, it was you know, almost 300 people at Mandiant spun up to something like a quasi wartime footing where they were doing all of this defense work, really answering questions, trying to make sure that they could do anything and everything that they could within the scope of their work. And what we saw from that you know, was 16 hour days in some cases, weekends and all that. And so the way that we needed to manage it really is to it's a leadership issue at the end of the day. It's what tone are you setting and how much do you expect from individuals and how much are you putting up front in terms of tools and process to really lessen the burden that, that they're willing to take? Um, you know, and I think that we experienced this quite a bit and learned a lot. You mentioned the Ukraine piece. I remember that really vividly. And it was amazing to see the impacts that we were able to produce 
But also there was this really interesting dynamic of, you know, and I'm telling you about your own team, so I apologize, but there's there's Ukrainians there. And so the people that are the best experts are now the ones having the most impact. And that's a that's a to your point, a leadership problem. How do you manage the work with the people needs? And also how does everyone figure out how to work together there and, and do a lot of that? No, that you're you're absolutely right. And you know, one of the um, concepts we had to get around and manage was for these very mission driven people, you know, if you tell them, you just say you need to relax, you need to take some time off, you need to do this. Well, for very mission driven people, that's always yes, later, right? I, I have to do this now, absolutely. but I'll get to it later, at the expense of their own well being sometimes. And so what we did is, you know, being a, a, a member of the Air Force, there's a term that many people are familiar with, and it's crew rest. And the reason I, I chose that terminology when I when I put this out was nobody ever accuses fighter pilots of being lazy because they need crew rest. We're all really grateful, let's say, if your pilot that's going to be pilot, you know, piloting the plane that you're on, or your family members is well rested and knows what to do with this very important job that they've got to do. So by kind of verbalizing it as here are the minimum standards that we have for crew rest, that's how I want my organization to to operate, you know, to get the best out of somebody in the long term, you cannot expect them to keep at an ops tempo that is endless, right? Because sooner or later, that is going to erode a person's ability to do their job. Um, And that was that's a really um, like I said, it's a leadership issue because you have to set the right tone. I, I absolutely agree. And I think that's really profound. Now, let me ask you kind of the inverse. What what have you found doesn't work when you're trying to tackle, tackle these culture, these burnout problems? What are some of the things that like we've tried that, it's just not going to work, let's move away from that? Well, I think it's when leaders just go and say things like, hey guys, make sure you take care of yourselves, right? When, when it becomes sort of a the perfunctory, uh, let's just say the words, but you don't back it up with any kind of policy or or accountability. Um, and so that we've seen that that doesn't happen because, again, these are really deeply committed people who um, tend to just be focused on the job. Uh, another thing that doesn't work is more strategic. It's when you spend your entire budget on um, the various parts of the cybersecurity, you know, platforms, endpoints, it's protection, everything, but you forget to invest in the workflows of the people that you have. So if you imagine somebody who's sitting in a SOC or somebody who's doing research, even today, a, a lot of times what, I, what I've heard is people love the mission, but they hate their job because it is so repetitive. They're still doing copy paste on spreadsheets. They're moving data from this place to this place, a lot of busy work, and it doesn't work then to not invest in the technology that's going to improve the workflow, uh, because that alone is a huge issue for people. I, I absolutely agree. And you're you're walking right into something we're going to do brand new for the first time in this episode. So for those who are dialed in, um, I've asked Sandra, her and I are both going to do some hot takes. We've agreed to do a professional hot take each and a personal hot take each. And uh, unbeknownst to you, Sandra, I know we're going to kind of do these blind, but I think you're basically going to agree with my hot take. My first professional hot take is that I think in cybersecurity, we think this is a technology business and it's not. This is a people business. We've absolutely forgot and we've overcorrected onto the technology and everything you just said really rings true. You can automate out large parts of this. The technology can do that. But if you're not addressing the needs of these people, it's just not going to work or else it'll work somewhere else, but it won't work in that organization. So I think I probably have found the one person that will agree with the hot take. Yeah, I, I do agree with you. And it's a it's a people business. And it's also, uh, you know, sometimes I think that we've lost our way when it comes to the concept of leadership. Right. What does it mean to lead a group? Um, there are a lot of people who, have, you know, they make a distinction between manager and leader and it really is sort of, I think, in my view, it is, you know, all of the above, plus the balance between the needs of the individual with the needs of the mission. So are you, do you have the right mix? Are you, are you over-rotated on, you know, borderline coddling, or are you over-rotated on 
you know, the mission without thinking about the people. There is a balance and every organization will probably go back and forth depending on the externalities of the situation. Um, but you're absolutely right. This, you know, without people, it, it's not, you know, there are people on the other side of, of the cyber attack. There are people defending. There are people who are supporting. Uh, absolutely a people business. I think you nailed it. Love it. I love being right. So let me ask you one more question, then I'll ask you for your professional hot take. Kind of sticking with the people side of the house, and you mentioned Ukraine, and I think one of the, the big topics we've heard in the last year has been around this public-private partnership. And I think Ukraine is almost the, the far right example of that, just based on it being a wartime situation. But when we asked organizations, do you find these partnerships useful? And, and this is very much on the private side of the house, the private sector. 89% believed that these public-private partnerships are beneficial and about two thirds, 64% thought they were highly beneficial to directly securing their organizations. Now the rub is only about a little less than half, 44% of organizations are involved in a single partnership. And I think one of the things we're seeing in this data gave us a, a ramp for to discuss some of this has been, we all wanna do this, but it's still kind of the wild west. There's still a lot of things that aren't nailed down. And I know this is a big topic at Mandiant. It's been a big topic for us at Rubrik. But how do companies fit into a world where public-private partnerships do end up in conflict situations like Ukraine? How do you work to thread the needle and do the right things here? There's a lot to that question. And so, you know, there, and I'll take it in a couple of different parts. You know, what you described uh, with the survey kind of gives me the the, the vibe around there are like the, the cyber have and have nots. And it's kind of feels like, you know, if you're a company that has a big DC presence and you have, you know, all the players, you know, at CISA and you have, you know, you, you have a go-to person and that public private partnership is professional intimacy and you're in, you, you have a seat at the table and some of these uh, working groups, right? You're kind of in this privileged place. And that's not really what every you know, owner of critical infrastructure is doing, right? Or every, uh, you know, CISO in a medium-sized company, not everybody has that privilege, right? And so it's, you know, it's about setting up the, the regulations, laws, or circumstances where it's really structural and systematic for everybody who needs to be able to have a partnership with a government person. If you ask somebody, you know, who in our spaces, like maybe that, that roles in our circles, they know exactly who to call at CISA if something were to go wrong. Yep. But if let's say you get out of the DC area, you get out of, you know, um, you know, the, the sort of the cyber circles that are around here. Um, what's CISA? You're right. Once you get at and and that's where we really need to double down on. Um, the other piece is we learned a lot with Ukraine about how we had a lot of ways across many companies at how we could help. And where the government was really, really helpful was, you know, we had sort of direct relationships that we could provide support, but coordinating for, you know, for funding, for um, relationship building across all of these different things, that's where that public-private partnership really became essential. And as we go forward into the future, um, if the community is going to rise up and assist again in this way, it's really going to need to be not just the, the goodness at, at you know from from the commercial side, but you know the government will need to put in frameworks that go beyond like personal relationships, right? Because you need to be able to scale that. And uh, so public private partnerships are really great. We need to make sure it's available for everyone. All right, Sandra. So I gave my professional hot take. Time for you on the hot seat. What's your professional hot take? Oh, my professional hot take. Um, so we've been measuring uh, ransomware for a long time, but we've never really know. You know, it's hard to say, like, is our sample set the sample set that is representative of the bigger population? Meaning, you know, we do about, a, you know, over a thousand incident responses a year and um, and we track things like ransomware throughout that. So what we've observed is that 15 percent decrease in raw numbers around ransomware, which is a really great thing. It, it's not enough. I mean, the numbers are still really high. But what I keep thinking about is what is the best way to measure um, ransomware itself, when you don't have a complete view. Um, one of the ways that we've been doing it as well is looking at sort of the peripheral 
market of, of, of dump sites, right? So we track all of these different dump sites. And what we're seeing is the proportion of dump sites, um, victims that whose data is spilled, is actually that proportion is changing away from North America by about 10% uh, over to Europe. So, you know, it, the, the idea is I really want to have a good way to measure ransomware um, because all the indications right now is that in the United States, it's going down just slightly. That doesn't mean it's not happening quite a bit. The levels are still high, but there's been a dip um, and the proportion have, have uh, moved away from North America. So uh, one of the things I'm giving a lot of thought to is how can we get a really good picture of ransomware? And I think that might be a way to do it. That's a, a profound problem. I mean, if whoever can really get their arms around that is going to help all of us. And that's that's really interesting to hear. It's trending down a little bit, but also shifting and also still demonstrably high from, from where it was last year. So that actually leads right into a question I've just been dying to ask. There's just no way I'm going to have the head of Mandate Intelligence on and not ask you to give us a proactive look. What are you worried about for 2023? What are the threats that you think we should all be focused on? Great, I, great question. Um, so there are a lot of things, obviously, that we've seen increase over the years. So uh, we recently put out a report looking at 2022 zero days. And again, you know, while it didn't really match the year before, which was at a high of about 80, we saw about 55 zero days exploited in 2022. It's still three times as much as the year before, um, you know, in, in 2020. So um, zero days, and of those that we could attribute, most of them were from China-based actors or China Nexus actors. Um, so, you know, what I expect to see is, you know, still very high levels of, of zero days being exploited. Um, another thing that we're seeing a lot of is, again, supply chain attacks. Uh, don't expect that to go away anytime soon. And, uh, and, you know, ransomware continues to be, be there. Now, one caveat on ransomware is we're actually seeing a shift away from straight up malware being used in ransomware attacks and more just emphasis on extortion. So we've been seeing that trend for, for a while. Um, what that means is in the future, you're likely to just be compelled to pay um, without having any malware involved with it at all. So we've seen threat actors do things like contact family members of yours, um, competitors, press, journalists, just to create a sense of urgency to embarrass and, and really uh, force a payment. Uh, so that to me is, is some of the stuff, unfortunately, we're going to see unfold in, in the cyber threat landscape going forward. I think those ones are really interesting because it, it speaks to how this world changes and, and it's easy to see it in hindsight. I mean, you mentioned the, the ODAs alone. I remember it wasn't that long ago when all of us, you know, on the threat side of the house, you, you knew all the O-days that were used in a year because there just weren't that many. You could track it off top of your head and now you can't. I was just I was just reading your organization's report on the 2022 numbers and it's like five a month. It's like more than one a week. And and that's the ones that, that are there. And it's just, there's no way. There's no way you, if you had told me in 2019, that would be the point where you wouldn't even check in routinely on that at a high level, I wouldn't have believed it. And, and here we are. And you mentioned, you know, we're talking ransomware and we're that used to be completely synonymous with encryption. And, and now it's not. Um, the ransom often doesn't involve encryption now. So that's really interesting to see change. Uh, speaking of interesting, uh, my probably the part I've been looking forward to the most is your second hot take, your personal hot take. Um, if you wouldn't mind going first, I'll give mine after the next question. My personal take is that I think too many people are shamed for liking to uh, catch up on things that are not just like hot dogs and hamburgers. Ooh, and there's a okay, lot of I can see that. that goes on about that. And I think it should stop. <laughs> so you're saying stop the ketchup bashing. Yeah, I mean, ketchup is delightful and delicious. And I feel like there a lot of times if I want to put it on something that's not one of those, especially with my foodie husband, I get the eyebrow raise, you know, like. What are you doing to, you know? You get the look? That. Yeah, I get the look, man. I can see that. And I, I'm the opposite end of your husband. I, I like ketchup, barbecue sauce, and salsa. But I'm, I'll am i probably have a condiment-themed hot take here in a minute. But I want to ask one more, you know, real question. And this is how I, I really enjoy wrapping each of these as the last kind of official question. 
we get a chance to look back. And, and I think one of the benefits of careers like ours, and I don't want to speak too much for your career, but you've had this really fascinating twist turn. You didn't come into this. You didn't go to school to be a cybersecurity expert initially. You did something else and then something else. And you've really kind of been around the space quite a bit and been in this industry a long time. And I think it's interesting to look back and ask this core question of, if you think of you know when you started and where you're at now, are you more optimistic or pessimistic and why? Well, you know, um, the common thread in my career has been, you know, 23 years in the intelligence career field. So that that's been the consistent part. It it wasn't cyber intelligence until about 2013, I would say, where um, that was when I, I started to do more of those projects and the job that I had back then um, and then did uh, a couple of, of uh, you know, academic pursuits in the area, which then sort of solidified the transition. I'm very optimistic because things like public-private partnerships have never been stronger. Um, I'm optimistic because we're seeing a reduction in, uh, in ransomware. Um, I'm, seeing, I'm, be, I'm optimistic because people have now accepted that um, cybersecurity is an important priority. So we're, we're not thinking or talking anymore about trying to raise awareness so much about whether or not cybersecurity is an issue. It's widely regarded as a very important issue. Now it's the, the, from my perspective, the conversation has now turned into, you know, how can we solve problems? How can we work together, right? Legislation on, on reporting requirements. Now it's, you know, things like the JCDC and really systematic and structural um, partnerships with, you know, government and, and, and the commercial side. So there are a lot of reasons to be uh, optimistic um, and in our industry, it's sometimes really hard to, to stay optimistic because of the you know, constant uh, drumbeat and onslaught of, of cyber uh, threats. Um, but I think we're learning to manage them better. And that's really what this is. It's a, it's a risk management game. It's not a, a, something that you win. It's really a mission that you're on. Yeah, I, again, couldn't agree more. I, I think especially that last piece you had, something that's really core to where we're trying to go with rubric is, you know, it's about resiliency. It's about how do you, how do you keep doing what you're trying to do? And what's interesting is now this is, you know, the third of these that we've done with these cybersecurity decoded. And I've always ended up with saying I'm optimistic. I'm more optimistic than I've ever been. Um, for folks that have known me over my career, that's probably a strange thing. But what's interesting is my reason for optimism has been a little bit different each time. And I think about this conversation and a lot of the things that I'm optimistic about is it doesn't, feel anymore like it's an organization versus the world. It feels like we're doing a lot more together as individuals, as teams, as companies, as governments. And that wasn't the case not that long ago. And that that brings me a, a lot of optimism. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that I don't know a lot of industries where your competitors are also people you're very close to and respect. So, you know, I'll give you an example. And, you know, in 20, uh, in the beginning, you know, the, with the Soleimani killing, we saw password spraying across uh, all of Europe to critical infrastructure from Iran. And one of the first places that we called was actually uh, over to our friends at CrowdStrike to say, are you seeing this? And, you know, it's really important because um, we just wanted to make sure that, you know, as a, as a community, we were really informed. And I could name a lot of other you know, organizations where we actually have very, very strong relationships. Now, of course, we're competitors. We want to win in all that. But I think that this unique industry, the cybersecurity industry, the one thing we have going for us, too, is that we all know who the real adversaries are. And once that clarity can permeate across an industry, um, it, it gives me the, the sense of optimism that, you know, we're going to be able to get over this uh, and manage this as, as a risk, um, you know, a risk endeavor a lot better because we have these strong relationships. Yeah, it really feels like we've kind of collectively come to this decision point that we're not competing for the same piece of pie anymore. We can bake more pies together and all of us serve our clients better. And, and it's neat. I, I really enjoy that. And very much your point, that that wasn't the case that, not that long ago. That was the last thing we were discussing. So uh, I really appreciate this, Sandra. I owe you my personal hot take, so I'll kind of stick with the condiment theme. Uh, this is probably going to make a lot of people mad, but I think ranch dressing is horrible. 
I can't believe we use it everywhere. I can't believe it's always an option. And I think anyone that uses it is just ruining their food. So I can't think of a better way to end that, Sandra, other than saying, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, this has been a great talk. I always enjoy when we get a chance to catch up and look forward to seeing you at RSA. Thank you, you too, Steve. Great talking with you.